Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. This is Ukraine War Frontline Update for the 29th of July 2023. Here on the screen is a map, is my map legend, is a map legend, yeah, yeah. That legend here, uh, no, obviously not, uh, is my map key. So you can uh, pause the video, check out what the lines mean, because I'm not going to tell you every video from now on, just to save a bit of time. Um, but then I spend time telling you about saving you time. So there you go. Uh, right, we'll go to the northeast sector, which is from Kopiansk to Svatova to uh, Kremina. There is some activity up here in the north. Syriac Maps, a pro-Russian mapper represented in red there, saying that, uh, oops, uh, lots of different uh, things going on here. So I did try, I've already tried this already, it's my second attempt. Um, that, uh, yeah, there's activity in the Sinkivka area to between the Oskil River and Liman Pershi. The Russians have restarted their attack in that area. That is referred to in Rebar, the pro-Russian source, saying in the Kupiansk sector that Russian troops are able to expend, expand their zone of control west of Liman Pershi, reaching the bank of the Oskil River. Uh, at the same time, to the south, the enemy was knocked out of their strongholds near Sinkivka. So this is Rebar saying that there are some strongholds, the Ukrainians have been knocked out near Sinkivka, and that the Russians have gained some ground towards the Oskil River just in this area there. Not mentioned particularly in the ISW, as far as I can see, the Institute for the Study of War. They do mention that at Syrsky, the Ukrainian ground forces commander in the region, stated that some of Russia's most professional units are constantly attacking Ukrainian positions along the Svatova Kremina line, but that Ukrainian forces maintain their control uh, of positions in the area. Um, and uh, we come further to the south, to this area just west or west southwest of Svatova here, where we have the Ukra Ukrainians. Well, the Russians gained some land quite quickly. Uh, and then the Ukrainians arguably did a counterattack and took some land back. It's, it's, there's not an awful lot of information coming out of here, not a lot of video evidence either. Uh, so we're kind of not able to massively confirm the claims that are being made. Andrew Perpetua says that he is represented by the blue line here. The Russian defensive lines have moved forward just between Karmazianivka and Novovodjanie there. So there's a small amount of land, just indicated by my cursor there, that the Russians have potentially gained in that area. He looks at shelling and compares that to you know previous areas of shelling to indicate where different sides are. Syriac Maps uses different methodology and is not very good at walking back overconfident claims. And I think the idea that the Russians advanced this far may have been true, but it may have just been like advanced reconnaissance groups in that area and that then being staked as the kind of Russian control and it's not quite the case. And there's evidence or at least claims that the Ukrainians took back Nadir uh, yesterday and that's not reflected by Syriac Maps. So Syriac Maps doesn't really walk back claims much. Um, so anyway, uh, that's by the by, I guess. Uh, Ukrainian general staff reported that Russian forces conducted an unsuccessful assault near Nadir. So that's that, that place we're talking about. Um, and that the Russians have advanced, well, it's a 1.5 kilometer depth, 12 kilometers long. Uh, I was just, sometimes when you're using sources that you don't have English as a first language, you, you kind of get a bit confused. Yes, I was confused about the 12 kilometer um, uh, dimension being used because it, it seemed to indicate that they'd gone 12 kilometers in one direction, but it's just like it's 12 kilometers wide, one and a half to maybe five kilometers deep, depending on who you listen to. Uh, the Russians are claiming that they have advanced further in that area. Uh, the Russian MED has also claimed that storm detachments have advanced west of Zhilivka, uh, three kilometers into Ukrainian defenses there. So there is activity still going on west of Svatova here, uh, but possibly stabilised, or certainly stabilised somewhat compared to what it was sort of three or four days ago, and differences between the mappers there. I would trust Andrew Perpetua there. So this is the Zhitlivka area towards Terny here, where the Russians have advanced, I wouldn't say it's three kilometres, or at least Syriac maps here uh, shows an advance that's maybe a bit more modest, of about sort of one and a half kilometres maybe, in that area that the Russians have restarting restarted advances in that uh, zone so we'll keep an eye on that it's a new place i think the russians are just trying to attack in as many places as they can to keep the ukrainians on their toes uh, the question is is it a good use of their troops or should they be 
plugged into you know Bakhmut or Zaporizhia, for example. Um, the, there is always activity in the Serebiansky forest. Uh, that's still the case. Now, if we come all the way down to Bakhmut. Rebar, the pro-Russian source, doesn't mention any of this. It goes Kupiansk right down to uh, Bakhmut. Their general claims, Rebar pro-Russian source, says that near Bakhmut, Ukrainian units continue their attacks in an attempt to establish control over Klitschivka. Russian troops are making heroic efforts uh, holding the defence line near the village. That is French fort. If you read between the lines, that kind of language means that they are in trouble and they are putting up... They might well be heroic, but you would only use that, I think, phrase if you are really under the cosh, and I think the Russians are under the cosh yet. But there are varying claims as to what is going on in Klitschivka. We'll come to that in, in a little bit. Well, I just want to talk about the north. Uh, if you look at this northern area, and they were talking about this on uh, Andrew Perpetua's live stream last night, there there is this high ground around Yekolivka, which is really important, and it overlooks the the rest of the area here. There's high ground he, around here as well. And I think the... Ukrainians really would like that high ground. We haven't heard much coming out of this northern area. And I keep saying that because it they did make some really good advances, the Ukrainians, and then it kind of stopped. But this would be really important. I'm going to tr see if I can do my 3D. Uh... Yes. OK, so here goes. Right. I'm going to switch it around and I'm going to go in. And as you can see, we're looking back across the. Uh, uh, Bakhmut now. I just want to sh give you a sense of the physical geography. So as you come into Yak, you can see Yakolivka is uphill there. And that is going to be important because once you're on there, you get a really good view, as you can see here, of all of this area. It's just, I think, really important if you can get artillery active around there, if you can get mortars around there, then you start putting loads of pressure on Solidar. Same as Solidar is downhill from this area just south of uh, Rozdolivka, as we're going south now. So that's, uh, I think, really important to, to understand. The topography is is important in this area, as it is in, in all areas of, of any battlefield, of course. Um, now, that so, but we haven't heard much that is happening there. S there is activity taking place, fierce activity, I think, in the north, although there's no territorial change. I was again listening to that live stream they were talking about how they've got video evidence of trenches here being full of russian bodies they're just yeah they can't really show them because they get restricted but it has been really expensive for the russians to continue uh, defending here now that is because each one of these places zalizhnansky around here dubova vasilivka or bakivka if you lose one of those then it helps to cut off the others so zalizhnansky goes then the ukrainians can advance along the road here and then kind of flank dubovo vasilivka the troops there and even bakivka if they lose bakivka then the same can happen this way if they lose dubovo vasilivka then the, these two can be bisected so all of these three are really important to kind of hold and the russians are doing so but at a really heavy expense and this feeds into the idea that the russians really are losing a greater number of troops still in Bakhmut than the Ukrainians are because they are so intent on holding Bakhmut. Um, there's also talk about certain places like Kudema having a similar importance in terms of the height there that if you could take that, I'm going to try and do that again here. I'm not so good at doing this, this 3D movement as you can, I'm sure, tell. But right, so Kudema here. I don't know if you can see because I can't on this the browser version of uh, Google Earth. I can't accentuate the height so to give you a sense, but you can see that this is certainly a ridge here. Uh, that if you get on top of that, then actually, so we zoom out a little bit, then it gives you that view over a lot of the rest of Bakhmut. So this is another high area that would have real strategic importance for being able to. Uh, sight uh, over Bakhmut and put your artillery, mortars and whatnot, get further range and you know, cause lots of problems. When the Ukrainians lost Kadema to the Russians, uh, as uh, certain analysts have said, that was really, like Andrew Perpetua is one of them, so, said that's really important. Uh, that was important position to have lost. And it made everything much more difficult for the Ukrainians. So in reverse, the Ukrainians would like to gain 
uh, control over Kadema, which means that that you know Andreev Kirkley Shivka and Kurdy Mivka are super important, and likewise in the north as well. But uh, I'm I'm sure it will happen. Just how quickly I don't know. They they make kind of stuttering gains. The Ukrainians not any fault of their own in this area. That's just the that it just indicates how much the Russians want to maintain control. Uh, over Bakhmut and its environs. Right, uh, we'll we'll have a look at what's said about Bakhmut now. Uh, so going to uh, the ISW, Ukrainian source claimed on the 28th that Ukrainian forces advanced over 1,200 meters in the Bakhmut direction. No granular information about that. Deputy Defense Minister Hannah Malia reported on the 27th that Ukrainian forces are continuing to advance south of Bakhmut, and the general staff reported yesterday that fighting is ongoing north and south of Bakhmut, near Klyshivka, Kodimivka, Andrivka, uh, so on and so forth. So Sirsky has say, stated that the Ukrainian forces are focusing on counter-battery fire against significant Russian artillery concentrations near Klyshivka. Now, Russians have, have had have lost an awful lot of artillery, self-propelled howitzers, no, sorry, self-propelled mortars in this area, particularly the Klyshivka area. They've lost a lot of artillery in the area, but they have a lot of artillery in this area. So it is, it's not that it's a drop in the ocean, it's they've got to continue focusing on counter-battery fire and activity to try and, and dent the Russians' capability of supporting their own defensive forces. Um, so... Uh, yeah, there's a uh, Russian mill blog has claimed that heavy fighting continues near Klyshivka and Ukrainian forces conducted unsuccessful attacks around Bakivka. Russian forces continued counterattacks to stymie ongoing Ukrainian offensive operations near Bakhmut and reportedly advanced on July the 28th. Russian mill blog has claimed that Russian forces pushed Ukrainian forces back from Klyshivka and that Russian forces fully control the settlement, but another mill blogger claimed that Klyshivka is currently contested. So there are these differing accounts of what's going on around Klyshivka or in Klyshivka. Uh, a Ukrainian source assess that Russian forces are preparing for counterattacks on the Klyshivka, Kurdimivka and Drivka line in order to buy time to build additional defensive fortifications rather than withdraw to prepare defensive positions further behind the line. So that's interesting. So that's uh, Russians claiming that they are um, putting up fights in this area precisely because they... Uh, they maybe don't have defences built behind these lines. They've done that a lot in the Zaporizhia region, and they have done it to some extent further behind here, but it may be just in the immediate vicinity of Bakhmut. As they were attacking there, they didn't have time to build them. They were building stuff further back here. It could be that they are trying to build defences to fall back into, but at the time being, they don't have those, so they're, they are putting the a lot of effort into holding Klyshchivka, Andrivka, and uh, Kurdimivka. Now... They may put in a big counter effect, uh, counter attack in that area. There are different claims as to who owns what in Klyshchivka, is it at least who controls what there. Um, Global War Monitor here says Ukraine has expanded its advance towards Kurdi and Mivka and Zelena Pilia. Uh, 1.3 square kilometers has been added to the liberated status. Ukraine's, uh, Ukrainians are now 300 meters north of Kurdi and Mivka and 800 meters west of uh, Zelena Pilia. In other words, they really are just here, um, 800 meters west of Zelenopilia. Well, it depends where you where you have that, but yeah, that's yeah, they're pretty much knocking on the door of these settlements, which we already kind of know. You Syriac Maps has Ukrainian gains here. If we go to Syriac Maps here. The, they say Ukrainians continued advancing along the water channel and took control over the strategic hill, which overlooks the town of Kurdi and Mivka. And that's obviously going to be important in the same way we were talking about, although not as significant as some of those other hills. Uh, but yeah, Kurdi and Mivka, they can, the Ukrainians can get across a canal here where there are tunnels. The canal kind of goes into tunnels underneath a, a land bridge there. Uh, over into Kodi Mivka. But of course, if that's the only point of attack, then you can just easily defend against that. So it's really important that the Ukra for the Ukrainians that they advance from the north along the canal as well. And indeed, if they can take Andrivka, then it leaves this area for the Ukrainians to, to take control of and really surround Kodi Mivka and Zelenopilia. Um, but yeah, just 
there will be different claims about Klyshivka and what's going on there. Other than that, not not a crazy amount of information. Uh, and we'll move on further to the south. And we're actually going to pretty much bypass Avdivka. There just isn't any information coming out about Avdivka today other than continued attacks in all the normal places. I talked about some Ukrainian gains around uh, Novelska yesterday. Uh, nothing else about that. Nothing about Marinka other than there are, there is fighting going on there. And again, nothing about Vukhladar or Pavlivka. So we move on to the Donetsk across to Zaporizhia, Oblast, this this sector around Velika Novosilka to the south of there. Lots of talk about that today. Uh, if we come to... Oh, actually, oh, goodness, I did mean to say that uh, there is footage of a Ukrainian vehicle on the outskirts of Kurdia Mivka there. That was the last thing I did want to, to say. Uh, I am going to plug that in because I do like me a good geolocation. Just to say that a Ukrainian vehicle is all the way back here. Um, there, it's been sighted exactly where you'd expect it to be. So that is to confirm those gains that we saw in Surat maps. Anyway, sorry about that. I, I don't like going back to places I've already dealt with because I've forgotten something but it happens all the time I forget things all the time so sorry uh anyway uh, let's go back to where we were this is the Donetsk front let's look and see what Rebar the pro-Russian source has to say in that sector Russian servicemen withdrew from Storomirsky to pre-prepared positions Russian troops constantly launch artillery strikes on the enemy in the village preventing them from advancing southwards okay so that's what they say We'll move on to look at Kenneth Runt. Uh, no, actually, Kenneth Gregg, sorry, who is the Finnish soldier in Ukraine, has some contacts. Take what he says with a pinch of salt. But he has an observation I shared with you in the news piece that the liberation of Staromirsky was done by the 35th Marine Brigade together with the Array Battalion of the 129th Home Guard Brigade. This is interesting because the media is now spreading information that it was a massive heavy attack from our side. But he says, so he goes on to say, it's not, it wasn't a huge attack, 12 APCs, a few tanks. It's taken one and a half weeks of heavy uh, bombardment from artillery, and that paved the way for the forces to attack there. It wasn't a huge force. However, it was a cooperation between the Home Guard and the Marines, and that the Home Guard who were didn't really exist up until the beginning of last year and then they were training in basements and eventually got outside and now that they are now the development is is quite significant they are a proper functioning brigade that have worked really well in tandem with the marines there and have done a really good job in taking star so that's what that thread was about uh, there is lots of talk today about activity around urajani uh, if we go on to look at a few other um, sources. Staromirsky does have, uh, is the scene of a lot of lost Russian equipment. Uh, there is just all sorts of stuff that uh, was lost by the Russians around, in and around Staromirsky. And indeed, there are claims that the Ukrainians got hold of in, some intelligence on some of the POWs. I mentioned that yesterday in this area uh, that, that give a, a sense of what the Russians are planning. I'm not 100% sure what they've gained, but that has come out. Urujani is is under threat, as I say, today. Um, there is heavy fighting in Urujani in Donetsk. Uh, Ukrainian defenders are advancing on the Priyatne Volodina Zabitna Bajanya line, clearing up operations continue in liberated Staromirsky. So that is to say, Activity in Urujani, it could well fall, and we'll go into that in a second, as well as activity around here towards these uh, Volodne um, and other places as well. Uh, so activity around Priyutne, but no gains as of yet over the last sort of three or four days in that area. Uh, concentration has been around Staromirsky. And after yesterday liberating Staromirsky, Ukraine has advanced in the, out to the outskirts of Urujani and added 4.5 square kilometers to the liberated status, according to Global War Monitor. And pro-Russian sources claim that the village defenses of Urujani are collapsing. Indeed, Romanov, a Russian source, says... And he reported two days ago that Staromirsky would be liberated and was correct about that. He's now reporting that Russian defences in Urujani are on the brink of collapsing. He also says that various commanders there are peeing themselves over having to inform Moscow. So things aren't going well for the Russians in this particular sector. Uh, Surat Maps agrees that now Staromirsky 
is under the control of the Ukrainians. They are somewhat slower, I think, to admit those gains. That wasn't till so after many other sources. A Russian blogger Ross Mazov says Russians have lost around 20 artillery guns, which equates to an ar one artillery battalion. Just an Avronisky ledge. That's a Staromalinivka axis in the past two months. So, and this kind of fits in, in with what we hear from the Ukrainian general staff, that just in this area, they have lost 20 pieces of artillery in the last couple of months. So you then take, yep, 20 pieces there, 20 pieces there, 20 pieces there, you know, so on and so forth. And it all adds up to fairly accurate figures from what the Ukrainian general staff claim. Um, well worth sort of bearing that in mind. Right. We go to ISW. Uh, there is not too much really to uh, to report, as in they, they do say lots, but nothing that I haven't already told you. Um, and uh, indeed, they don't say an awful lot uh, of what's been going on in Robotna. Now, Robotna is a bit controversial. I told you this morning that, you know, the Ukrainians made had you know took some heavy losses there. Yes, they've gained ground, and indeed, uh, Suryat maps shows that they have gained ground in that area. Uh, here's what they say: Ukrainians made significant advance west of the town of Vobovo and reached one of the first Russian defensive lines in this axis. However, they have lost a lot of uh, troops and um, and equipment in so doing. Uh, interestingly, Andrew Perpetua, the blue line here, showed some gains for the Russians just to the east of Robotnet. I don't know that that's actually gains or a rejig, because when you've got the fog of war and you've got attacking, you've got loads of explosions and, and movements and vehicles and things happening. You know, drawing a line on a map is a risky business. And actually, the next day, once things settle down, you're like, okay, people are shelling there, that's going on. Okay, so actually, we need to move that a little bit further forward, rather than, as I keep saying, rather than the Russians putting on a counterattack to regain what is only a very small amount of territory. But they may have done that too, though, of course. Now, I'm just going to refer you to what Constantine says. So Constantine helps out Andrew Perpetua with his live streams. Uh, I think he used to fight for the Ukrainians, and he's now living abroad. He, I think he may have fought from 2014 onwards. Um, but he said, uh, in referring to footage of that uh, Robotna event and, and the loss of all those bits of kit, I won't show you that just in case it gets sort of restricted and whatnot, but he says, whoever planned this assault should be jailed. I'm sorry, but I can't stay silent. Not all commanders are the best and not everything is perfect, but this is a complete disaster in planning. I watched this failed attack from multiple drones now. So you're having the Russians coming out and saying, look what's happened in Robotna. And then the next day, look what's happened in Robotna from a different angle, as if it's a new thing. It's the same thing, but from multiple angles. But that allows someone like Constantine, who has got military experience, uh, to, to look at that and go, yeah, no, this is an absolute disaster. I watched this failed attack from multiple drones now and have no other conclusion that whoever was planning it has to be put to jail immediately. It's either in negligence or treachery. And like I said to you in the news piece this morning, when you do something that's negligent in your normal office job, if that's what you do, or if you're a fencer and you're building a fence and you, you do it a bit badly, then you get called back to rebuild that bit of fence and you get a rap on the knuckles. But you know, it's like, come on, mate, you can do a better job. If you do negligent work in, in the war zone in the army, then you know 100 people die. Literally, people are dying. Uh, equipment's being blown up, and you're sending people to their death. So it, it's, a, it's, it's a whole different game, isn't it, really? A whole different kettle of fish, like making decisions with that hanging on it, every decision. So although, you know, they the Ukrainian forces have made gains, and here we've got Osint Uri saying... Uh, Ukrainian forces have begun to bypass and flank Robotna and the heavy Russian fortifications there. Russian sources report there is heavy fighting, significant Ukrainian losses, which normally means that they've lost control of the battle space since they can't report any other good news. So that's like tr trying to say that they're, they're, the U Russians are reporting heavy Russian Ukrainian losses because that's what they're going to do anyway, and that just shows that they're in trouble. Actually, not necessarily. I think 
there were heavy Ukrainian losses here, although it might be that Ukrainians make some good advances as well, but it's come at possibly a, 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 a terrible cost for them. But these, again, then, you know, seeing it in, in a kind of realistic sense, there are going to be decisions like this that, that are going to lose Ukrainian, needlessly losing troops. And it is part, it's, it's horrible, but it is part of, of the battle space, isn't it? World War Two was an eventual success for, for the Allied forces, but goodness knows how many individual decisions were made that were terrible by the Allies along that journey. Along along that route to eventual success, and then Ukrainians aren't magic. Yeah, they're not going to be like they're not just superhuman, amazing people. These are actually people who've been trained, but kind of rushed trained with NATO. It's still better training than the than the Russians, of course, in many cases. But they've been brought in. Some of these are very green. They haven't been in, you know, in warfare before. They've been brought to the front line. They're inexperienced, and some of the decisions are not the best that they could be and there was a rumor that around here there were too many commanders trying to make decisions and it was all a bit of a nightmare there was also another claim that the ukrainians that went driving in here and there was kind of wondering why they weren't using smoke and they drove in got annihilated from multiple sides by russian atgms and artillery and mortars and whatever else and drones as well and when you're being hit by ATGMs and drones and you're not using smoke, then what's going on? Now, one of the theories or one of the rumours is that the Ukrainians drove in here because they were told that those trenches were under their control. So they were just driving up to like drive up to their own trenches and it wasn't. They were Russian controlled trenches and they just got annihilated. So there is that. But nonetheless, I, I think... You will get eventual success here. They are making ground in the area. It's just, you know, they could do without uh, decisions that, that are, are bad decisions. In the area at night, there's still evidence that Ukrainians are doing what you'd expect them to do, which is here using Miklix to clear uh, minefields, clear pathways through minefields. That's how they break through the corridors in the Russian minefields, and they do it at night. So still evidence of that happening. Uh, what else can we say about Zaporizhia? Well, actually, we come on then to the west of here. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in uh, the Robotnet area over the next 24, 48 hours, uh, whether they will continue to try these attacks or whether they'll kind of move back, lick their wounds and regroup. There, are, I said earlier that there are claims that, that there's slightly more competent advances, albeit a lot slower and more incremental here to the west of Robotna um, by a different group, uh, different battalion working there, or different brigade working there, sorry. Uh, but anyway, we move on to Kamiansky, where Suryat Maps has some success for the Ukrainians here. Situation in the Zaporizhian front, uh, during the last few hours, Ukrainians restarted offensive operations. Actually, I don't think that's true. That's been going on for a couple of days. Uh, west of Lobkova, taking control over some of the southern hills of Kamiansky and forcing the Russian army to retreat again from parts of the town. So this is looking a, a good sector for the Ukrainians. Indeed, Russians targeting, it says no reports, uh, forces southeast of Kamyanska, uh, confirming their presence on the other side of the canal. The Ukrainians have advanced, already progressed further to the south, and there's some... Uh, this is... I, I presume Ukrainian presence here or yeah so that's Ukrainian presence there and the understanding now is they're past that they've moved uh, further to the south here so that is to the south of the Dnipro River that as it comes in and meets the uh, Zaporizhia Reservoir. Um, okay so that is the situation there we don't have too much else uh, uh, in, in the area, there is some claims about uh, Kimber Peninsula, interestingly. Nothing about Kherson and the Antoniski Bridge again today. In the ISW, we go back to there. They mention an, uh, a Ukrainian official indicated that Russian forces on the Kinburn Spit struggle with morale and discipline issues. Ukrainian Southern Operational Command spokesperson Hermenyuk reported that Russian forces have mined the outskirts of settlements on the Kinburn Spit in Mikhailiv Oblast. 
preventing residents from leaving. Hermeniuk stated that morale is low among Russian forces on the spit and that the Russian military is not conducting rotations in the area. I don't think they're conducting rotations in most places. Hermeniuk reported that Ukrainian forces continue conducting precision strikes against Russian artillery positions when Russian artillery units deploy to firing positions on the spit or, or on the peninsula. Uh, this, is, this whole area is the peninsula and the spit technically is just this bit at the end. But there are artillery i think there's probably artillery more in in these areas here that have traditionally been attacking ochakiv which was i don't know if it still is a marine training uh base they've got these little ports that get uh hammered by russian artillery so the ukrainians have been trying to do a lot of counter battery fire here and uh, take out Russian artillery there. So morale is low for Russian troops there, according to the Ukrainians. The last thing uh, I've got to say really is um, that, yeah, while looking for more information on the explosion at Taganrog. So I talked to you earlier about Taganrog being hit by a missile that the Russians claim was intercepted, but it wasn't. It just hit slap bang in Taganrog. There are two air bases, I believe, at Taganrog, uh, there and there, that the claims are that they were the real targets uh, rather than the missile going in the middle. So maybe it's a missile that was errant, um, but we don't know. But while looking for more info on the explosion in Taganrog, it uh, was on a NASA FIRMS data. So remember, FIRMS records heat uh, signatures, the large heat signatures. And he says here, this source says, uh, a whole barracks and depot are presumed area presumably on fire. Coordinates are here, which is about 45 kilometers northeast of Taganrog. And there, there are further claims about fires in the area and the airfields around there. So I would expect those airfields to be uh, to be hit at some point. Um, but uh, nonetheless, let's go and, and plug that in to uh, here. So there is fire taking place over there so then there's some kind of depot military base here and that's where the fires are taking place so you can see that 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 looks like yeah uh that does look like a military base as for, according to these 2018 uh images so it could be that 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 is on fire at the moment and that's pretty significant fire too if you look at the um firm's data it's quite extensive uh, for what is going on there it's not just like one little place on fire but it looks to me like quite a large area uh, on fire there so anyway i just thought i'd add that it's not so much to do with the front line but uh stuff is happening uh outside of the borders of ukraine uh, as well as ukraine hitting a number of places and we heard today that the chonhar bridge here uh connecting you know the chonhar peninsula oops no here uh, has been hit today. We're unsure of the damage, but it's it's probably a storm.